Now, this morning, Brother uh, Noah asked me to bring you a Bible lesson, a little Bible teaching on dispensational truth. So we're going to get some strong meat now. And uh, now, don't, don't worry, I'll give you some honey and bread and milk tonight. But right now, it's going to be raw beef steak and barbecue pork for about an hour or so. And uh, let's get, let's understand each other in this thing. The purpose of Bible study is for two things. First of all, Jesus Christ is the Word, so He's revealed in the Word. One of the main reasons why you should keep your nose in that book is to get to know the Lord better. And the second reason for this is so you can know what's right and what's wrong, don't get screwed up in your doctrine. Now, if you talk about the other thing we've been talking about, and they all have the place. Uh, frankly, uh, the Lord called me to be a teacher. I'm a Bible teacher. And I must uh, confess to you, I don't appreciate it a bit. <laughs> uh, I have never uh, liked teachers for teaching. I've had 22 years of formal education, and I despise teachers. To me, a teacher is a is a is a is a is a is a wheelchair case trying to teach you how to run. <laughs> and uh, what I like to do is I like to do it. I like to do it. I like to watch it. Uh, the only only sport I'd ever watch would be hockey or boxing. That's all I'd ever watch. You know why I don't watch the rest of them? They put me to sleep. I'd go to sleep watching a football game. I mean, to the line, back the line, to the line, on the bench, time out, all oh, enough is enough, man. <laughs> but I like to play it. Now, I still play touch football and soccer and still play tennis and still play racquetball and number of other things. But I like to do it. See? And the Lord called me to teach, I must confess that I despise teaching. And I guess uh, I, it's a, I guess uh, confession is good for the soul. I think it's only been in the last ten years that I've taken my calling seriously. And uh, I like to do it. I enjoy preaching on the street. I enjoy, nothing I enjoy better than sitting down at a table with a guy right across from me who's lost and just going through it with the scripture. Nothing I like any better than that. Nothing I like better sit down at a table with a Catholic priest here, and a hyper-dispensationalist here, and a Jew here, and a Jehovah's Witness here, and just banging out with the Word of God. I love that. <laughs> I don't y'all get a chance to do it. The Lord called me to teach, and when I learned how to teach uh, and took it seriously, I was over in Vienna. And I was over there, and I was looking around Vienna, different things, and uh, I noticed the elderly women with white gloves on would walk around the park late at night. 12 o'clock or 11 o'clock at night, they weren't worried about getting mugged. Not over there. I noticed the armed guards over there at the airport had the submachine guns around the neck loaded with the clips in the gun, and uh, they'll take care of you. And I looked around over there, and I didn't see any uh, chewing gum wrappers, cigarette wrappers in the streets anywhere. They're all clean. I drove them down the highways, and there weren't any billboards in the highways. And I never stayed in a motel or hotel and opened the window that any flies came in because there wasn't any flies there. I've been to Germany four times in August and never seen a fly or a mosquito there. And you know, the thought occurred to me going through there, you know something, these people, you can't tell them anything. And what, how, what, how are you going to tell a German anything? He knows everything you know before you ever start with. <laughs> I mean, uh, over there, the right of way in the left side of your car. You say, why? Because you can see there. Any fool could figure that out. Why are the fellow on your right have the right of the way when you can't see him? You got a pasture there that blocks you. You got a door frame that blocks you. If the guy on your left has the right of way, all you got to do is look out the window, and there he is. Now you think any dumb bell could figure that out, but an American can't figure that out. And I got to look at those things. One night I was lying there in the bed, and I said to myself, "These people got everything. They got everything. They got the music. They got the art. They got the writing. They got the science. They got the food. They got the money. They got the culture. They got the literature, and they're lost." I see them walking around the street. I look in their face. I know that look it's like a zombie. And I, 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 I got, I got so torn for those people praying for them. I was going to drop what I was doing then at the oh, old sixty-four years old and go overseas. And the Lord said, well, what's the matter with these people, Pete? And I said, they don't have anybody to... <laughs> and about then the Lord said, to what, Pete? I said, well, <clears throat> that ain't my teaching the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord said, what I called you to do. 
And ever since then, it's been a little bit different. Now, this is Bible teaching. This is not evangelism. This is a, we're going to have a Bible lesson this morning. We're going to study a while. Now, in your Bible, it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, it says in verse uh, 15, if you have a King James Bible, it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a word that thee doth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, that's in a King James Bible. You say, what other Bible is it in? It isn't in any other Bible. If you have any Bible except the King James Bible, you do not have that verse in it. If you've got a new King James Version, sorry, it isn't there. If you've got your NIV, an ASV, an OS, sorry, it's not there. There's only one Bible that tells you to study the Bible. That's King James. If you have any Bible but a King James, the word study is not in the verse. That's a commandment. That's a commandment like soul winning. That commandment is study. That's a commandment. Study to show I approved unto God. It's been removed from all the new Bibles. All right, now study it. Write it to find the word of truth. The word of truth has divisions. For example, everybody, I don't care whether he's a dispensationalist or non-dispensationalist, believes there's an Old Testament and the New Testament. And they make a division between them. Everybody does. Catholics do, Jews do, Protestants do. There isn't anybody that ever read a book that doesn't know the, the New Testament is not the Old Testament. There's a division. So when he said, write and divide, you've got to divide somewhere. You can't make these two the same. Over here he says, every creature of God is good, and nothing be refused, and be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God by prayer. Over here, if anybody eat anything in the, in the water that has, doesn't have fins and scales, it is an abomination to be shut cut off from his people. You can't make them the same. They're not the same. <laughs> Oh, but the law came by Moses, but grace and truth by Jesus Christ. They're not the same. I thought I said, well, they're saved the same way in the Old Testament, they're on the New Testament. That's the most cockeyed nonsense you ever heard in your life. If they're both saved the same way, what's the New Testament for? If they're both saved the same way. It's nonsense. All right, now there's two systems. I don't care if you're not a dispensationalist, you know that. You know that. You know the two of them. Now, the ways of breaking this thing down, and one of the ways of breaking this thing down is most of them do like this. They say, well, there's a, in the Old Testament before the law, and then there comes the law, and then there comes the New Testament. So some of them break it down into threes, and they break this thing down here to where this thing here goes from Genesis to Exodus 20, the law. And when the law comes in in Exodus 20, that continues until the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then you have the New Testament sitting over here, so the three periods. Some will make that distinction. Uh, another way to make the distinction is what we call covenants. And when you get covenants, you begin to break them down further. For example, God made a covenant with man in Eden. That's the Edenic covenant. Then when God, when God ran man out of the Garden of Eden, he made another to covenant with him. That's the Adamic covenant. Then along came Noah, and God had gave Noah a covenant, and that's the Noahic covenant. Then along came Abraham, and God made a covenant with him, and it's called the Abrahamic covenant. Then along came uh, Moses, and God made a covenant with him, and that's the Mosaic covenant. Then along came David, and God made a covenant with him, and that's the Davidic covenant. That's uh, six covenants. One, two, three, four, five, six. Along comes Christ, that's the New Covenant, the New Testament. Now that's seven, seven dispensations. You got two here, you got three here, and you got seven sitting in here. There's another way to break it down, and this way it breaks it down into something that's even uh, more detailed. You have an Edenic covenant. Oh, right, that'll be Genesis one to three. That's before we'll make it one to two before God throws the man out of the Garden of Eden. Then you have a thing sitting here where there's a Adamic covenant. That's going to go to Genesis chapter Genesis chapter uh, three on to the law Exodus twenty. Then you have a law given in Exodus chapter twenty, and this law takes you on up to uh, the time of uh, Christ. Then you have an intermediate period, a transition period here in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then you have a New Testament beginning over here like this. Then you have a tribulation beginning in like seven years. Then you have a millennium sitting over here a thousand years. So this is a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven system here. But this seven system is different than this seven system. 
Now those are ways that, that when, when a fellow gets in the Bible and gets studying, he sees those things. Now maybe you don't spend enough time in the Bible to see those things. But those things are in there. And uh, we have what we call hyper-dispensationalism. Hyper-dispensationalism is a teaching that the division between these places is a clear-cut line. That is, you go along like this and then cut, and you go along like this and then cut, and you go along like this and cut. And in that kind of thing, there's no overlap. For example, here's a, here's a, here's a case of the book of Acts. Here's the book of Acts, sticks out like this. And it goes Acts chapter 1 to Acts chapter 28. All right, in this system here, uh, we'll take a man like uh, Ethel Bullinger, who's about 1890. And he doesn't have your church age or the day of grace or the age of grace begin to last 28. The whole book of Acts is over before Bullinger has any church age. The whole thing is gone. That means anything Paul wrote before Acts 28 has no application to you. And he wrote Romans before Acts 28. So you've got to look out for Ethelbert Bullinger. <laughs> and Ethelbert Bullinger, he'd knock out 1 Thessalonians, that's out. 2 Thessalonians, that's out. 1 Corinthians, that's out. 2 Corinthians, that's out. Romans, that's out. You sure is cutting up your Bible into a mess of stuff. <laughs> that's Bullinger. Now, some of the other hyper dispensations say no. They say the new age of the church age begins in Acts chapter 18. You know why they put it there? Because that's the last case where Paul baptizes anybody. So somebody is trying to get rid of water baptism. So they have to go along up there, and then it begins there. Cornelius Stam and that crew, they say, no, the church age of the age of grace begins with the Apostle Paul when he's converted, Acts chapter 9. Now, those are, those are attempts to cut the book of Acts in the place, you see, study to show thyself approved unto God, a word need not be ashamed, rightly dividing. So they got cuts in there like this, like those are divisions. Now, there are all kinds of things wrong with that, and we'll get into that here today. But if you want to get the book of Acts right, I'll draw you the simplest chart on it you ever saw, which will protect you from false doctrine, and that was the idea in studying. Study to show thyself approved unto who? God. You didn't study to show how smart you were. You didn't study to demonstrate your knowledge of the Bible. You studied so God could approve of you. That's why you study. If you have the right motive to start with. All right, now here's Calvary here. Christ dies for your sins according to the Scripture, buried and rose again third days from the dead. Now, when he comes, Israel is at the peak. You say, why? Because the Messiah is there. Israel is on top. They're forgiven. The Messiah is there. The kingdom is about to come. There's no doubt about it. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's all right there. Glory to God in the highest, peace and earth, goodwill to men. Everything is set up for the kingdom. Elijah's already come, John the Baptist. See, it's already set up. All Israel has to do is accept the king. Down he comes into Jerusalem. Hosanna, the son of David. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. It's all set up. What happens? They reject him. In Acts chapter 7, they reject him. And there is one miracle conducted in Jerusalem after Acts 7. Up to Acts chapter 7, you read about if the shadow of Peter passes over a bunch of people, they get healed. After Acts chapter 7, it says, take up this collection for the poor saints at Jerusalem. They're not even making a living. And from there on, Israel goes down. And when you get that book and the book of Acts, Israel's on the bottom. Now, there are four places in the book of Acts where this transition is marked. All right, the first one is there. And God is all through with the Jews there in Judea and Jerusalem. You come over to Acts chapter 13. In Acts chapter 13, the Lord is all through with the Jews in Asia Minor. You come over to Acts chapter 18, and the Lord is all through with the Jews on the European mainland. And when you get to Acts 28, the Lord is all through with the Jews in the whole world. And you know what marks those places? Boy, are they marked or are they marked? In that place right there, the next man that gets saved, he's the open eunuch, and then God calls out the apostle of the Gentiles. In that place there, he says, if you judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, we turn to the Gentiles. At that place there, we turn to the Gentiles. Acts 28, the Gentiles will hear. 
he says that thing three times and doesn't do it. It isn't done to there. You can't cut it. It's gradual. There's a gradual displacement of the Jew. And the attempt to take the book of Acts and cut the thing up and say, okay, everything before here is Old Testament, everything after this is nonsense. Now let me show you the other one. That's why when we say we're not hyper dispensational, that's what we mean. We don't we don't mean we don't believe in dispensations. Of course we believe in dispensations. But we don't emphasize dispensations. Now I'll show you why in a minute. Well now down here at the bottom is the Gentile. When the New Testament opens, the Gentiles in the bottom of the pile. I mean, the kingdoms of the Jewish kingdom is about to come, and didn't you read that? Did you ever read your Bible in Luke chapter 1 and chapter 2, where Simeon goes there when the Christ comes to the temple? He says, Blessed be God who raised up the son of David, the horn of our salvation, to deliver us from my enemies, that we might live all the days before him in holy. Why, it's the thing's over. God goes through the Gentiles. And when Christ comes up at the end of the book, uh, at the beginning of the book of Acts, the first thing his, his disciples say is, Lord, wilt thou at this time again restore the kingdom to Israel? They're expecting it right then. But what happens? The Gentiles, Ethiopian trust Christ, Cornelius trust Christ, the Greeks trust Christ, Paul's missionary journeys, Gentiles on top. That's what's called a transition book, folks. And there are three of those books in your Bible. One of them is Matthew. That takes you from the Old Testament to the New Testament. One of them is Acts. That takes you from Israel to the church. Hebrews. That takes you from the church age and the tribulation. And they're gradual. They move like that. You can't split the thing a fine hairline on it. Now there's certain crises. There's a crisis right there. And things are never the same after that. There's one here in Acts chapter 15 where the apostles meet together and decide that a man is saved by grace through faith plus nothing. Amen. See, there are points in there you can pick out where you can see that a change has been made, but the change is gradual. Well, now this thing here, dispensation, this is a Greek word, oh glory to God, hallelujah. <laughs> it looks like that. Oikonomia. Now this thing here, oikon, is a house. And nomia, namos, is a law. What this thing here is a household arrangement. That's what that word means. Dispensation. That thing is a household arrangement. And the amount of damage done by Cornelius Stam, who was a Bible corrector from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, and often used the RV and the RSV to correct the King James with, the damage done by those fellows almost incalculable. And I'll show you why. Take your Bible now and turn to Ephesians chapter 3 and get that in one hand, get Colossians chapter 1 on the other. And the thing that they've really messed up for the body of Christ here is the meaning of that word dispensation. They've got caught what, what, we, caught what we call the of trap. And if you know what the of trap is, the of trap is the inability to get a right interpretation from a verse of scripture where the word of is used. Uh, let me ask you this. What is the truth of God? Is that the truth about God? Because God is the object? Or is that the truth that God gives you, God is the subject? You see this one here? The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit that is given us. Is that our love for God or God loves for us? Boy, that I will flip you, that will flip your lid. A two-letter word. How about this one here? The fear of the Lord. Is that you fearing God, God is the object, or is that uh, God fearing you? What you fearing God? That's the object there, obviously. But that ain't too obvious. Now, I'll show you something. Get Ephesians chapter 3 there in one hand, and look at that word dispensation. Look at that word dispensation there in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10. Somebody read it out for me there. That in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. All right, now that might be a period of time. In the dispensation of, then he named the time, which is called the fullness of time. But still it could be the dispensation in the sense that 
And this is in the thing that God put out. He dispensed. Your term is dispensary. And the dispensary is where this medicine is given out. Oh, and I'll show you one place where it doesn't mean a period of time at all. Colossians 1.25. Colossians 1.25. Somebody read that. What, what, what period of time is that? Anybody tell us what the dispensation of God is? Why, somebody's off their rocker. A dispensation isn't a period of time at all. I mean, we use it, we apply it, but it is, that's what it is. You know a period of time called God. <laughs> of course you don't. Somebody is off the rocker. Now read that verse again. God's the subject. God gave it to him. Yes. It's not the object. But that other is through him. I come to Ephesians 3 and watch how these fellows get thrown. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, verse 2. Somebody read that. Ephesians 3, verse 1, verse 2. There you go. You know what they did? They made that a period of time. There's a period of time called the grace of God given to Paul. Nonsense. Who ever heard of God giving a period of time to somebody? Father, they're, they're off their rocker. Paul says, I preach you the gospel of the grace of God. There's such a thing as the gospel of the grace of God. There's not a period of time called the grace of God. And if it was, it wouldn't have been given to a man. You see that problem? And look at that thing you just read there. The dispensation of the grace of God given to me. What did God do? He dispensed something to him. What he dispensed to him? Grace. Look on down the passage and see where it is. Come down about four more verses. Have you heard of the grace given me? What verse is that? Read that for us. That's what God dispensed to him. God dispensed grace to him. The dispensation, the grace of God. God was the subject. There was no period of time called the grace of God. That is all. If it had been, it wouldn't have been given to Paul. Turn to John. Boy, you talk about making a mess of things. This age may be called, behold, now is accepted time, now is the day of salvation. But it's not called the dispensation of the grace of God. That is the grace that God dispensed to Paul. All right, John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And in John chapter 1, it would be given to Christ. Look at verse 17. Somebody read that. Grace and truth came by who? Or it sure didn't come by Paul. If it ain't dispensation of grace in that book, it began with Jesus Christ. It don't begin with Paul. Now you see, somebody has got a screw loose upstairs. And what they've done is said, well, up to here is like this to Paul. And after Paul, there's a period of time called the dispensation of the grace of God. No. Up till Paul, it's a certain way. And in Paul's time, God dispensed grace to him to preach the gospel of the grace of God. There's no pit of time called that thing at all. It ain't there. But you see, we've used this word dispensation for so long to refer to a pit of time that everybody thought it was. You just read where it wasn't. Some of you folks have a little skeptical look in your face like you've been hanging out around a dumpster with a bunch of flies and you must have been doing it. You must have some rotten literature in your home. I just showed you from Colossians chapter 1 the dispensation of God. Didn't I? All right. Would any of you care to get up after I'm through and tell us what that is? Couldn't even stand, couldn't? Neither couldn't Bullinger. You say, why? Because it ain't there. <laughs> Turn to Titus, book of Titus. Titus chapter 3. Let me show you that of. Boy, that of can fix you. 
Did you know every JW in this world believes in the, in the Christ or the created God because of the passage in Revelation that says that Christ is the beginning of the creation of God? That I'll just throw him off folks' Bible studies to keep you from getting into error. All right, now get over there to Titus chapter 3. I want a verse there. It says, by the, uh, by the renewing of the Holy Ghost. What verse is that? Five, five. All right, somebody read us 3 5. One, two, two heresies in one verse. You had to get washed to get regenerated, right? Doesn't say washing of regeneration? Making regeneration a subject? You see that thing? Every Episcopalian, Anglican, Catholic, Methodist, Presbyterian root from the world couldn't get the two-letter word. Renewing of the Holy Ghost. You had the Holy Ghost before you lost it and got it renewed, didn't you? Doesn't it say renewing of the Holy Ghost? Okay, they all threw you into hell. <laughs> Two letters. That's all it takes to slip your hitch, brother, right there. Now, you said, Pastor, you reading right there? The washing of regeneration. Listen, now listen to me. Regeneration is the subject. That's what washes you. The washing of regeneration. You see renewing the Holy Ghost? It's the Holy Ghost that renews you. You see, it's the subject. Boy, you think a fellow could get that thing, but they can't get it. <laughs> the dispensation of the grace of God, God the subject, he dispenses the grace. There's no period of time called the dispensation of the grace of God as a period of time. That's nonsense. The heresy on top of that. <laughs> All right, now, now we have the introduction. Now maybe we can get something done here. Let's, let's take one thing here. Let's... On this matter of grace, take your Bible and turn to Leviticus chapter 20, and get Leviticus chapter 20 in one hand, and then get, uh, well, you don't have to turn to this, you know David's case. Get Leviticus chapter 20 and look at verse 10, and tell me that grace is not manifest in the Old Testament. Leviticus 20, verse 10, somebody read that. Is that right? Was David under the law? Did he commit adultery? Did the woman commit adultery with him? Were you the one who put to death? Don't tell me grace suddenly showed up with Jesus Christ in the absolute sense. Give me that stuff. What he says, the law came by Moses, but grace and truth of Jesus Christ. Are you going to interpret that to say, well, up to Christ there wasn't any grace? Okay, how about this? Up to Christ there wasn't any truth. Uh, you see the mess you get into? You know what's wrong with somebody? They got one oil in the water, man. They think Ruckman is nuts, but that's because they're just as nutty as a pecan pie. I learned how to read when I came up. I don't know about you, the schools I went to, if you learn how to read, you flunked and had to repeat the whole cotton picking gray over again. Now, I'm putting grace over here and grace over here. You know why I'm doing that? to show you that grace extends through every dispensation to God's dealing. Ruckman says this, Ruckman says that, you tell him that. Grace begins in Genesis 1, and it's not over until Genesis 22, or Revelation 22, and it's not really over then. Because the Bible said in the ages to come, he might show us the amount of his grace. Jesus. So it's just, you can't get grace out. If it weren't for grace, nobody would be saved anyway. If it weren't grace, everybody would be in hell. So it's a matter of how God deals with people in certain periods of time that we're talking about when we talk about dispensations. And we've taken a term before an epistle that technically doesn't mean a period of time. It's a household arrangement. It's how God sets up a household and he dispenses this fellow this job, this fellow this job, this fellow this job, this fellow this job, and give this fellow this to do this job with, and that do that job. That's what a dispensation is. There's nothing with a period of time. Now, you can apply it, and we're going to apply it, but in applying it, we're going to be a little bit more cautious, a little bit more biblical than some dark, dumb, dry cleaner who thinks he's brilliant because he hasn't got the sense God gave a brass monkey. And I said it with charity, of course. And, all right, now. Now, take your Bible and go back to Genesis. Now we're ready for the study. <laughs> Genesis. 
All right, here we are in Genesis. And we get in Genesis, and in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, the Lord makes the heaven and the earth, he puts a man down in the garden. And the man's in the garden. There are fruit trees all around, it's real fruit, not Frisco fruit. <laughs> And he got him there, and he tells him, he said, There are all those trees you can eat, but the tree in the midst of the garden, you're not to eat it. The day you do, you're going to die. You know what that, that is called? Now, I'm going to talk about these things as covenants instead of dispensations. Because I observed in reading the Bible that what the Bible is is a series of things where God makes an arraignment or an agreement with a man. Now, uh, that's really the Bible is about. It's more about covenants than it is periods of time. Now, the covenants current, uh, cover a period of time. But here's the deal, brethren. The deal is, how can I get to God? How can I have fellowship with God? How can God talk to me? How can I talk to God? And the Bible is a record. God, who in sundry matters and times, diverse matters and time past, has spoken to us. What you want to find in that Bible is the place where God dealt with a fellow and gave him something. He did, Paul. Both the things that I'll appear and shall appear unto thee. He Caught him up the third hip one time and showed a whole bunch of stuff, see? What you want are the deals God made with man in a revelation to him to see how the household set up. What is the first one? You know what we call this? We call this Edenic, which simply means Eden. And in that covenant, that's in chapter 2, you look at it there in chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. In chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, notice that it is a covenant of pure works. 2, 16 and 17. Look at it. Nobody's going to be saved by grace through faith. They're going to be saved by works. They're going to go to hell by works. It's works. In Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, nobody can get saved by grace through faith because there's no faith to be exercised. Turn to Romans chapter 8. I'll show it to you. Turn to Romans chapter 8. Get Romans chapter 8 in one hand. Romans chapter 8 in one hand. And you get 2 Corinthians 5 in the other. If you can see it, it's not faith. If you can see it, it's not faith. Second Corinthians five. Second Corinthians five. Second Corinthians five. Somebody read us verse seven. Read it again. All right. Now read it again. Emphasize the but or and. All right. Emp read it again. Emphasize the not. Now, have you got that now? You walk by faith and not by sight. If you're walking by faith, you're not walking by sight. And if you're walking by sight, you're not working by faith. Is that clear? <laughs> you got any problem with that? You know what Adam did? He saw God every day. They had fellowship together. They walked together. They talked together. They converse. Adam's not living by faith. He's living by sight. The thing he's told not to eat of, he can see. He passes by the cotton picking thing every day. And oh, save by faith, he's walking by sight. And his work's going to determine his salvation. Romans chapter 8, verse 24. Romans 8, 24. Somebody read that. Romans 8, 24. Uh huh. Uh huh. Adam has no future hope at all. His hope's right there. The idea of saying that Adam in the Garden of Eden was saved the same way you're saved. Ho 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 ho. Did God Almighty ever tell you if you ate something that in the day you ate there, if you're going to die? I mean, the Surgeon General might have told you that, but he told you wrong anyway. I mean, the Surgeon General can be dangerous to your health. <laughs> Now listen, you're not saved where Adam was saved back there in the garden. Your plan of salvation is not you got eternal life until you eat of that tree. That ain't your plan of salvation. I thought I said you're saved like you're saved. Somebody's got rocks for brains. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. The first plan of salvation is salvation by works without faith. <laughs> and that of yourselves, <laughs> it is not a gift from God. <laughs> Boy, if I don't shake him up. You're going to put your last plan of salvation over here. It's going to be works too when we get to it. 
The Bible is going to end just like it begins. All right, now you take Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. So let me read just the verse. The evidence of things what? Not seen. What? Not seen. Now how could you say they're the same? Any folks ever seen Jesus Christ? Any folks ever seen New Jerusalem? Any folks see the cherubim, the seraphim? Of course, some of these charismatics they have, you know. They've been up. <laughs> oh, yeah, ma'am. They've been up there walking around to see the pain of James got in the glory elevator, you know, and went up, you know, and talked to Paul. Oh, yeah, ma'am. But I said, you've never seen that stuff. You walk by faith and not by sight. How could you say they were the same? Somebody said, well, Adam is looking forward to the cross. Oh, cut it out, will you? Cut it out, will you? I mean, the cross wasn't the form of capital punishment of the time of the Assyrians. I mean, that's after, that's after David gets on the throne, man. You got the thing all messed up. Now, what's this for? This is to keep you from false doctrine. All right, now the next covenant here we call Adamic. And the Adamic covenant, God makes an agreement with Adam. For that thing, come to Genesis chapter 3. And Genesis chapter 3, look down there, anywhere down there, at about verse 0, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, down through there. And that's an agreement God makes with Adam. And he, when he drives Adam out of that garden, he says to Adam, he says, uh, you're going to make your living the sweat of your face, and I'm going to curse the ground for your sake. And he says about your wife, I'm going to put enmity between uh, uh, your seed, the seed of the woman, and the seed of the serpent, and it shall bruise thy, uh, he, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shall bruise his heel. And that Adamic covenant, that thing is like that, and that Adamic covenant, when God drives that man out, look at the end of chapter 3, he made coats of skin for him and his wife. And he covered them, clothed them with what? The skins, not the wool. The skin. You couldn't shear the sheep. The sheep had to die. So the first blood shed in this earth was not that of Diplodocus or Tyrannosaurus Rex. If you've got some dumb Christians that believe in them dinosaurs. Before Adam. The first blood shed in this earth is the blood of a lamb. And that's why the Masons pulled up the lamb skin, you know, and put it in the coffin with the brother. And that's why when you graduate, they give you what they call a what? A sheepskin, you see. And what you can't understand, the King James Bible clear up. But nine times out of ten, it'll put a negative light, and folks don't like that. Now, what's this fellow here? What's his situation? He is saved by grace through faith. That fellow is covered with the blood. And that's an operation of salvation by grace through faith. And that's why it's connected with the seed of the woman. You see that thing? It's messianic. Amen. Now there's a type of your salvation. But it ain't your salvation. I mean, when God put a sheepskin on you? Amen. Say, God killed a lamb. Yeah, but he killed the lamb of God for you. Amen. Not a four-footed creature. You say they're the same. They can't be the same. Hebrews says it is impossible the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. Adam's sin wasn't taken away. It was covered. Yours is taken away. Amen, brother. Uh, how can a fellow say, well, they're saved in the same way in the Old Testament, they're saved that you're just as nutty as a fruitcake, and your problem is you don't study. That's your problem. And that's the problem with half these college professors and teachers in these schools. They don't study that book. Now, you see that thing right there? That applies to every Christian in this building. Here's Bullinger and Sam. God bless their stupid hearts. Here they are, they're saying, the only thing doctrinally for the Christian in this age is the Pauline epistles. You raving maniac, why do you die? <laughs> that's why you die. Why do you go back to dirt? That's why you go back to dirt. Why should you rule your family? Genesis chapter 3. Why people, everything in that book up to Genesis 12 holds on every human being on the face of this earth. You talk about rightly dividing the word of truth, man. Some of the greatest Pauline doctrines you ever saw in your life were written by Moses. 
You say, who wrote Genesis 1 to 12? Moses. <laughs> Boy, if people don't have a time of it. You know, he said of that woman, you're going to have pain in childbirth. Okay, ladies, amen or not? You didn't get that on a Pauline epistle. He said, Adam, in the sorrow, you're going to eat of that ground all the days of your life. That isn't a Pauline epistle. But you fellows have to do it. In the sweat of your face, you're going to make you a living. You don't sweat out bodily sweat like we did last night. You sweat on income tax. I mean, you're going to beat, you're going to beat them out. <laughs> I mean, I mean, everything he said in that book up to Genesis 12 is binding on every child of God in the body of Christ. And Paul didn't write it. Moses wrote it. <laughs> People, that's what the Bible study is for, to keep you from getting screwed up and knocked them. You can't go over there and say, well, this isn't for me, and that isn't for me, because it's in the wrong section. I can take you place that Bible to something for you that's in the wrong section, and something that's right for you in the right section, and something that's wrong for you in the wrong section. You have to study. You can't just say, now I got it. <laughs> he didn't like that. You know what happened one time? An old black woman came to Jesus Christ. She was a Syrophoenician by nation, born there, but she's a Canaanite by race. And she came to Jesus and said, My daughter is grievously vexed of the devil. Heal her, heal her, heal her, heal her. And he didn't pay attention to her. Just ignored her. I mean, rude way to deal with people. Just didn't pay attention to her. And the disciples said, Won't you please grant that request and send her away? For she crieth after us. I haven't got time for it. It was about all on her knees. Thou son of David, have mercy upon me. It isn't fit to take the children bread and give it to a dog. You know what Christ was? He was a dispensationalist. <laughs> he said, I am not come to anybody but the lost sheep of the house of what? You see? And she wasn't the house of Israel. So she couldn't get the dispensational blessing. <laughs> you know what that old black woman said? She said, that's right. But us dogs, <laughs> you know what a female dog is called? Isn't that strange? <laughs> Stuart Custer, Bob Jones, I mean, I mean, I mean, what a, what a ding -a leg man. <laughs> I mean, the guy writes in his book, says, Jesus Christ was never rude in dealing with anybody. <laughs> is that so? Is that so? You, you know, and he, and, and he says, that woman, he says, I can't take the bread and give the dogs. And she said, yeah, but the dogs, class by herself. Get the crumbs on the table. Amen. He said, Good night, nurse. She got out of the wrong dispensational branch. I'll just have to take care of her anyway. She got it. <laughs> she was in the wrong dispensation and claimed the wrong promise and got healed. Amen. Now, how do you figure that? See? I mean, not say, Well, you can't claim the promise in the Psalms because they're under the law. You can claim anyone God gives you faith to claim. Amen. He gave that woman to over why he healed her. She wasn't the house visitor. She's a Gentile. Christ just, what he do, lie? I'm not sent to anybody but the lost sheep of the house of Israel be healed. <laughs> you see, you see, if you're a strict dispensationist, you're antichrist. <laughs> you know, you were the greatest missionary in the world, what he was, John Patton, went to New Hebrides Island. You would read about that fellow. You talk about, you talk about a Hollywood uh, shoot 'em up character. I mean, John Wayne just pretend like he's a, you know, he never did nothing. He never fought in a battle and just had wax bullets shot at him out of BB gun. But you take John Wayne, he no kind of a hero. You take John Patton out of musket right in his face about seven times and spears and bows on his throat about eight times and lost his wife and kids in the mission station burned and lost all his Bibles. They all burned up to pieces and stayed in the island until every adult native in that island was a professing Christian. There's a man. Amen. You know how he got there? By ignoring dispensations. <laughs> you know what he claimed for his missionary call? Psalm 2. Ask of me and I'll give to the heathen for thine inheritance. Amen. That isn't written to John Patton. <laughs> I mean, always ask who's speaking to whom is he speaking. <laughs> That's God speaking to Jesus Christ. And John says, it's me. And if Cornelius Stam had been around, he'd have talked him out of his calling. Oh, Brother John, that's Old Testament. That's under the law. That's the Davidic promise to the son of David. You can't claim that. 
He did, and it worked. <laughs> All right, this next one here is called Noahic. In this one here, the Lord takes a fellow and puts him in a boat. And it's not even a boat, really, it's a box. And he puts him in this box, this boat, and sails him around the world for about a year or so. And then when he gets out, he has the whole world. And he gives him the sign of this covenant, and the sign of this covenant is a rainbow. And he says to Noah, he says, and turn to Genesis 9, and turn to Genesis 9, Genesis chapter 9, you'll see this covenant. Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9, there's your covenant. Let me ask you this. Do you think when Noah got his covenant, do you think he knew the full content of that covenant? Do you think that any of these people did? You take when, when God gave this thing to, to Adam, do you think at that time Adam knew what the seed of the woman would be? Well, of course not. Do you think he grasped what it meant when it said it'll bruise thy head? Why, the, the saved scholars at Bob Jones and Tennessee Temple and Midwest and Southeast and Northeast and Mid-South and Pillsbury and Pacific Coast and Dallas, they don't even what that verse means right now. They think it means the devil's head is rooted at Calvary. Paul told you 30 years after Calvary in Romans 16 that God was going to bruise Satan out of their feet in the future. What a time they have of it, don't they, man? How could Adam have known what was in that promise if a Greek professor in 1992 hadn't got it figured out yet? Now, you know I'm telling you that? Because, boy, when you get the book of Acts, you know what you get into? You get into the thing where nobody knows what's going on half the time. <laughs> and they gradually find out what's going on. And when you start making cuts in there, you just, you violate every principle of New Testament, Old Testament, biblical study. Now here's Noah. Here's the Noahic covenant. What is this thing? This is by grace through faith. Noah found grace in the eye of the Lord. Not a boy comes out. He's not under any law. He saved by grace through faith. But do you think he understands his covenant? Why, of course he doesn't. How in the world could he have understood that? Do you think, do you think when Noah got out of that ark and the Lord talked him about these things and said, uh, that Japheth shall dwell in the tents of Shem? Do you think that Noah, by any means in the world, could look ahead and see the time that you Irishmen and Scotchmen and Norwegians and Polacks and Hunkies and Krauts and Limeys and Frogs and the Spicks and Wops or whatever you are, that's what upsets folks so bad, you know, <laughs> that you're going to come over here and take the tents of the American Indian away from him? He'll dwell in the tents of Shem. You see ground you're sitting on right now in Ohio, it isn't your ground. It belongs to Shem. It's an American Indian. He come from Shem. They're Orientals. The brown people. The majority of the people in the world are brown. You say, why? That's the original color. That's what Adam means, red-brown. You know what you did? You stole them tents. <laughs> you know what the Bible said you're going to do it? Right there. And Noah couldn't have figured that out if he'd figured all night. The computer, he couldn't have got that thing figured out. How could he get it figured out? The scholars haven't got it figured out yet. <laughs> and they took him away. Do you think this fellow understood when he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem? Do you really think that at that time Noah said, Uh-huh, all the religions in the world are going to come from Shem? But they do. You don't know the religion of this world doesn't come from Shem. If it's from Mohammedism, it's Shem. If it's from Buddhism, it's from Shem. If it's from Catholicism, it's Shem. If it's Judaism, it's from Shem. If it's Zoroastrianism, it's from Shem. If it's Brahmism, it's from Shem. If it's Taylor, they're all from Shem. He couldn't have known it. Well, here's the next agreement with man. This is called the Abrahamic Covenant. Abrahamic Covenant. And this is the covenant God made with Abraham. This covenant God made with Abraham has a number of facets to it, and it's repeated almost, it's repeated five times. And within this Abrahamic covenant that God made with Abraham is another covenant, the sky is under it, uh, which we call, uh, which we call the Palestinian covenant. Take your Bible and turn to, uh, Genesis chapter 15. Palestinian covenant. A Palestinian is a Jew. An Arab is not a Palestinian. He's an Arabian. All right, Genesis chapter 15. And get Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. Uh, they'll pick up uh, about 13 to 21. About 13 to 21. 
And notice that thing there, in that thing there, there's a promise there not only of a, of a seed and a son, but a land. And that land is the land of Canaan. And that isn't all. With that land of Canaan, there's promised a king. Look at uh, get Genesis chapter uh, 17, and look at verse 6. Somebody read it for us back yonder, back over in the back. Everybody here back there. 17 and 6. Read us Genesis 17 and 6. What? Kings? You see that thing? That ain't no spiritual promise. That's a literal physical promise of a literal physical visible king with a literal physical king on the throne. So when Abraham comes up, you're advanced here. And you've got a you've got a foretaste of a time when a piece of land is going to be given to his descendants and there are going to be kings running that land. Do you think do you think Abraham would have grasped all that? Of course not. All right, that's the Abrahamic Palestinian covenant. Take your Bible there and turn to three other places quickly. <laughs> Genesis fifteen, verse four to six. And Genesis thirteen sixteen, and there's that thing given again. Genesis thirteen sixteen. There's that thing regiven. Genesis thirteen sixteen. Genesis fifteen four to six, there it is given again. I'll give it to you one more time. Genesis twenty two, verse seventeen to eighteen. That thing is repeated over and over and over and over. Genesis twenty two, seventeen to eighteen. I'll spread your seed abroad as the dust of the earth and the sand of the sea and the stars of the heaven. I'll give to this land. Lift up your eyes now, all the land thou seest. He lift his eye in the north, the west, the south. All this land I'll give thee in thy seed. It's a Palestinian promise and it's given to Abraham. How's Abraham saved? We know how he's saved. He's saved by grace through faith. When you read back there in Genesis 15, the beginning of that chapter, in Genesis 15, along about verse uh, Forward to verse 6, he brings him out at night, and he says, Look now toward the, toward the heaven and tell the stars if I'll be able. And Abraham steps out and looks at those stars and wants to start counting them. Tell them. That's what a teller is, count money in a bank. He says, Tell them. And he starts, and he says, I give out. I just can't, I can't number them, Lord. And the Lord said, So shall thy seed be. And he said, Praise God, isn't that wonderful? I believe you. And the Lord said, You do. See, I believe you. Well, you crazy old fool, you're over 90 years old. Well, if you say, man, I'm going to have that much seed, I'm going to have that much seed, I guess. Well, man, you're seed now. You're dead, man. You're not going to seed. Do you say I was going to have that much seed? Yes. Okay, I believe you. Amen. You do. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> well, I said, okay, if you're crazy enough to believe me in a thing like that, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you my righteousness. And he has righteousness imputed to him, which is a type of your salvation. Turn to Romans chapter 4. It's a type of your salvation. But it is not your salvation. Romans chapter 4. Well, remember, say they're looking forward to the cross. No, they weren't. Abraham was looking forward to any cross at all. He's believing the stars up in the skies. Now, the Lord takes me out, brings me out, and he sends me out there, and he says, Now, look up in the hill, Ruffin. Now, look up there. I said, What's that? He said, It's a dead Jew. I got sure it's a bloody mess. Lord said, That'll get you to heaven. A dead Jew will get me to heaven? Yeah, he'll get you to heaven. You believe it? Okay, I believe it. <laughs> you crazy? <laughs> no sacraments? No golden rule? No Ten Commandments? No Bible study? <laughs> I mean, no water baptism? I mean, no, no repent and be baptized and have the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost talking with tongues and holding out to the end dying in a state of grace? Lord, if you said that dead Jew would get me to heaven, I'll trust that dead Jew. <laughs> Lord says, okay, if you're... If you if you're crazy enough to believe what I said I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna give you my righteousness. And I got it. I got it. I don't know about you, you speak for yourself. I'm not one of these we fellows. You know, if we accept Christ as our Savior, then we me, I got it, I got it. You speak for yourself. Oh, when you do or not, I do. Turn to Romans ten. Romans ten. How could you say salvation the same? Abraham's a type of your salvation. He ain't your salvation. Why, people, it is impossible the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. Abraham's sin is taken away? Nope. If he's spiritually circumcised? Nope. 
Is he born again? Nope. Is the body of Christ? Nope. Has he been redeemed? Nope. Why would you say it's the life of your salvation? You're mad or something? When you get saved, you're born again. He wasn't. You're spiritually circumcised. He wasn't. You're placed in Christ. He wasn't. You're completely justified. He wasn't justified. They offer up his son Isaac, James chapter 2. How could you get him confused? Romans chapter 10. I'll tell you how to get him confused. You don't study your Bible. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. My brethren, my heart's desire and prepare for you that they might be saved. For I bear them a record to have a zeal for God, but not according to righteousness. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the rights of God, for Christ is the end of the law for righteous to everyone that believes. They're not the same. You think the same? Keep reading. The righteous which is the law speaketh in this wise, the man that doeth them shall live in them, but, 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 the righteous which is the faith speaketh this wise, say not in thine heart. You see that stuff? What saith? That the word is nigh thee, in thy mouth, in thy heart, in the word of faith, they're not the same. So I said, well, back in the Old Testament, the saved were looking for them, and they all shut your mouth, you don't know what you're talking about. They were saved back in the Old Testament by doing what God told them to do. The Lord said to Noah, build a boat. I'll do the job. He said, Abraham, believe you're going to have kids. I'll do it. He don't tell you to do that. Imagine me giving an invitation. All you people that are willing to build a boat, come down here and get on your knees. And it's got to be three stories high and 120 cubits per 60 cubits. I mean, what a thing. Suppose I said then the service line, now you want to be saved? Oh, I go out there in the streets and look up there. Well, you couldn't see nothing in this town anyway looking up. We have to get out of this town until we see anything looking over your head. But look up there and you saw stars up there. you got to believe you're going to have that many kids. You don't tell them that. All right, there's that one right there. Now, what is a Palestinian? It's a Jew. And in 1918, the Balfour Declaration, they were given the land, and they couldn't get back until 1948. And when they did, the UN very generously gave them a piece of land just about that big. And after the UN voted to give them that land, they came in there, the Arabs attacked them. And they attacked them, and they lost their shirt. And when they lost their shirt, the Jew wound up with that, and this, and that's what they call the West Bank. You know why they call it that? Because of a bunch of truth-perverting, truth-hating liars. When they say West Bank, you dumb, stupid Christians, you think it means the bank of the Jordan River. That's why they said bank, B-A-N-K. You think about the bank of a river, don't you? It ain't the bank. It's 70 miles up and down and 30 miles and 20 miles deep. It's half the land of Palestine. Why did the newspaper do that? Why do they do anything? <laughs> I'm going to thought it breaks into Lubin's, you know, and kills 22 people, and they say, stop the guns, stop the guns, get the guns, man. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine what happened that night if he'd come in there and there were 10 people in their arms? Oh, he's never got his killing done for that day, brother. And the fella comes slashing through that thing in the car and gets out, and here four people stand up. <laughs> he ain't going to do it. You're not going to stop criminals by disarming people. You're going to stop criminals by arming people. How are you going to do it? If you want, listen. If you want, uh, I don't mean to get off on this, but if you get, if you, if you want the, if you want the lowest crime rate in the world, you go to a place like Switzerland, where every male is required to have a gun and operate in order. Required to have one. Now, if you want to go to a land where everybody gets killed 10 a day, go to Washington, D.C., where they have the strictest gun rules in the world. That's where they get murdered. All that kind of, I won't even get on that. All right, now, anyway, a little bit later. Here, here, here's, the big, here's the big switch. You come along here and turn, take your Bible and get to Exodus chapter, Exodus chapter 20, and especially Exodus 19, verse 5 to 8. You just read about that Jew under the law, that he was going about to establish his own righteousness, and he had a perfect right to do that. Because of the Mosaic Covenant, this is the covenant given to Moses. In the Mosaic Covenant, there is an element of faith and works. And there isn't any way in the world you can get around it if you read any Bible at all. 19, somebody stand and read for us Exodus 19, verse 5 to 8. There you go. Then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all the people. 
Go ahead. said, we will do. That covenant is a covenant of faith and works. Take your Bible and turn to Deuteronomy chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30, I want to have somebody read the last two verses, three verses, the last three verses of Deuteronomy chapter 30. You can't beat that thing with a stick, man. Deuteronomy chapter... covenant of faith and works. Your covenant with the New Year New Testament covenant is not a covenant of faith and works. It's by grace you say through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, not of works, not of works. One of my buddies down there in, uh, named uh, Gorman down in, uh, in St. Pete, not, not the one the Swagger's messing up with, but uh, down in St. Pete, he had, a, he had a radio program and actually the Campbellites wanted to get his audience. So they got a radio program right after him. That's standard operating procedure with uh, Campbellites. They try to get on the guy who's got the, the most audience, and by time right after him, they get his audience. And back in those days, that would be called RPM. They were, they were wax disc records, 33 RPM. And what the preacher would do is he'd make a disc of his broadcast instead of a tape. And sometimes those discs would get stuck like a record. If you ever have those old records playing in the Victoria, you know, they get stuck, and they'd repeat something. And he put that thing on there, and this, it was a Campbellite radio station with a Campbellite announcer. And he got up and left the, cons uh, the console, the, the board, to go back to get a Coke or something, and that thing was running, and it got stuck. And it got stuck on Ephesians chapter 2, which, if you know a Campbellite, is just too much, you know. And that thing said, for the Bible says, by grace you faith through faith, and not, not of yourselves, Either if the gift of God, not of works, that any man should boast, not of works, that any man should boast, not of works, that any man should boast, not of works, <laughs> and that Campbellite radio station for five minutes, not of works, that any man should boast, not of works, that any man should boast, and he finally came back in and got the table going again. Oh, now this thing here is not that type of thing. This thing here is faith and works. Now I turn to Ezekiel and I'll, I'll show you how salvation of the law goes. Ezekiel 18:24. Don't you ever look anybody in the face again and tell me they're the same after Ezekiel chapter 18. Somebody in the back give us Ezekiel 1824. 18.24. Sure. He'll die in his sins? Wow. You know what Christ said in John 8? If you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Well, the pastor read that fellow just read and what it said. It said, if a righteous man quits doing right and does wrong, he'll die in his sins. Is that your salvation? Imagine a fellow saying they're the same. You can't die in your sins. You're in Christ. You're not in your sins anymore. You're dead in your life as if with God in Christ. You're not in your sins. Your sins are on Christ. The very idea of saying they're the same. 
when David got in trouble, you know what he did? He got down and said, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the mother through thy tender mercy, brought out my transgression, create me a clean heart and a right spirit within me. Against thee, the only have I sinned and done this evil in my sight, thou might justify thou, so forth and so on. And came down there, when he got down there, he said, Wash me this, I shall be whiter than snow. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Is that New Testament? Not unless you're half out of your mind. <laughs> Paul says, Read not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed or the day of redemption. I'm not worried about losing the Holy Spirit. What's David worried about it for? He's under the law. I'm not under the law. You can't make them the same. I don't care if every fundamentalist of the world they were the same, it just goes to show that he doesn't spend much time in the book. All right, now we come to the next one. This is called the Davidic Covenant. Now, these are, if you want to get dispensation, this is the best way to handle it. And if the agreement that God makes between himself and, and his people or men at certain times, 2 Samuel 7, 2 Samuel 7, this one here has to do with a son and a throne. 2 Samuel 7, and look at verse 13 to 16. 2 Samuel 7, verse 13 to 16. This is called the throne of David. And we know who sits upon this throne, because this throne is called the throne of his glory, and Christ sits on it in Matthew chapter 25. And Christ mentions it in Matthew 19. When the Son of Man shall come and sit upon the throne of his glory, then David is a strong type of Christ. He's the strongest in the Bible. In the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit upon the throne of his glory, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bear a son, and shall call his name Jesus, and he shall be called a, a, a mighty of the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give to him the throne of his father David. Then David has a special place in the Old Testament nobody else has got. And that's why that fellow committed adultery and murder and didn't suffer for it. For his death, God didn't kill him, although the law said kill him. David is an exception. And David is under a situation of faith and works, but he is given a promise of grace that nobody else in the Old Testament is given. Turn to Isaiah chapter 55 and I'll show it to you. Because Isaiah 55 in one hand and get Acts chapter 13 in the other. And this promise of grace is so exceptional that Paul applies it to the gospel of the grace of God in the New Testament. Acts chapter 13, Isaiah chapter 55. David is the exception to the rule. Isaiah chapter 55, somebody read us verse 1 and 2. Go a little bit further. There it is. See that thing? The sure mercies of David? That's not given to anybody under the law. It's given to David. Now come to Acts chapter 13 and watch Paul take that thing and apply that thing to New Testament salvation. You say, why? Because it's everlasting. It's eternal security. And that promise is given to David but he don't, he don't know it. That's why he's sweating out that thing about losing the Holy Spirit. He don't understand that thing. Well, they don't understand in Acts chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4. On Acts chapter 13, Paul preaching. Somebody read me Acts chapter 13 about, uh, give me about verse, uh, well, it's, what is it? 34. Right, somebody read 34. There it is. Now keep on right. What verse was that? Oh, now give me 38 and 39. There we go. There we go. There we go. There we go. There it goes. 
and the mercy of David, a picture of New Testament of salvation, just a faith by faith, by believing, and getting out of the law of Moses. And David's under it. So it's a prophecy, and it's a prophecy, him something special or something going to take place later. Now, if you want to see how strong that is with David as a type of Christ, take your Bible down and turn to 1 Samuel, and I'll show you one of the strangest things you ever saw in the Scripture. Get 1 Samuel 20 and 2 Samuel 14. First of all, get 2 Samuel 14, 20. That Bible's a wild book, folks. That's the wildest thing you ever got your hands on. 2 Samuel chapter 14, verse 20. Now, that's a woman talking about David. That's a woman talking about David. Somebody read me 2 Samuel 14, 20. Well, she likes him to an angel of God. You know, Paul said in Acts chapter 27, There stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. And he said, You received me as the angel of the Lord, even as Jesus Christ. But it's strong than that. So I'm going to give me 1 Samuel. Give me 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 12. 1 Samuel 20, verse 12. Boy, you talk about strong. What? What? He said to David, what? He said, what to David? That's a funny thing to call David, isn't it? Isn't that the strangest thing you ever saw in your life? Try it again. Isn't that something? Addressing David as the Lord God of Israel? <laughs> you talk about a type of Christ. You take David, he's born in Bethlehem. Christ is born in Bethlehem. He's anointed among the midst of his brethren. Christ known as David, the king of the Jews. Christ is king of the Jews. And Abraham, David likened the angel of God, and Christ the angel of the Lord, and Abraham, the, David addressed the Lord God of Israel, and Jesus Christ, the Lord God of Israel. You're taking that path there, of course, we know what's going on. <clears throat> what's going on is Jonathan is praying as he's talking. But he's walking along like this, and he's saying, Oh, Lord God of Israel, will you? He's praying while he's talking. You know, he used to do that. Billy Sunday used to do that. Bob Jones Sr. told me that he used to take meetings from Billy Sunday that Billy Sunday couldn't handle in the afternoon, afternoon meetings. And on the way to the tabernacle, he walked alongside Billy, and he said, Billy was so close to God in prayer that you couldn't tell when he quit talking to you and started talking to the Lord. And he said, he walked alongside me, put his arm around me, and said, now, now Bob, when you get up there, give it to him. The Lord, help him to, give it to him. Lord, help him not to fall back. Lord, fill us by the Holy Spirit so he can speak the truth. Speak the truth, Bob. Give it to him. Like that. And you couldn't tell where the wig was. That's what's going on there. And John says to David, Lord God of Israel, see, that's what's going on. But boy, what a coinky dinky. <laughs> I mean, that thing is sure coming there like that. All right, we're coming on out to the end now. Now we have the new covenant. Take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter uh, 27. Or Matthew 26, I guess it is. Matthew 26. And the New Testament uh, is the arraignment that Jesus Christ made for Israel. And this new covenant is a covenant whereby as it turns out, as it's revealed, it's a covenant where a man is saved by grace through faith in his finished work on Calvary's cross. But do you think the people that got that covenant realized what was in it? No way in the world. Matthew chapter 26, I want, what's verse 26 say? Okay, go ahead. See that thing right there? Now, do you think those disciples sitting at that table understood what he was saying right there? All right. You turn to Acts chapter 3 and see if they understood what he was saying. 
In Acts chapter 3, he's been up there 40 days and 40 nights talking to them about the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and there's some things he still hadn't told them. Acts chapter 3. In Acts chapter 3, pick it up there about verse, uh, I want a verse there, it says, Repent therefore and be converted, or the, what is it, 19, read us that, brother. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, and the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Go ahead, look further. And he shall send? Verse 20, And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before will preach unto you. Whom the heaven must receive with time of restitution of all things spoken by now, see the thing right there? Here Christ dies for your sins. Your sins are paid for. They're blotted out. Paul said they're blotted out. He said blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. But in Acts 3, now we're getting with it. Acts 3, Simon Peter doesn't know that the sins are blotted out. It's progressive. You can't draw a line in there. Let me ask you this, when Christ rose from the dead in John chapter 20 is by the Sea of Galilee and he's going along there, or 21, he says, uh, come on boys, there's breakfast ready. And they pile the ship, come up the shore and sit down and there's a bunch of coals there and those bacon coals. He has uh, fried, uh, uh, fly, fried clams and fried shrimp and, uh, and barbecued lobster. Could they have eaten it? How many say yes? Let me see your hands. How many say no? Let me see your hands. I don't know what I'm talking about. Let me see your hands. <laughs> well, <laughs> Leviticus 11 says you can't eat anything in the water unless it has fins and scales. Lobsters and shrimp and clams don't have fins and scales. That's the law. When did Simon Peter find out it was all right to eat clams and lobsters? Acts 10. Now we got it. Clean over here. But this thing in the resurrection took place back here. Why, sure they could have eaten it. But they wouldn't have dared to eat it. Why, if Simon Peter is telling the Lord nothing doing seven chapters later, man. Acts chapter 10, rise, Peter, kill and eat, nothing doing. <laughs> Can you imagine what it would have been like on the, on the resurrection morning if they'd come in there and found that stuff there? Have a hell of a meal, boys. What's that? <laughs> Clam and lobster. Well, they thought he was the Antichrist, man. <laughs> They'd have got up and left. You say, why? Revelation is progressive. You cannot cut it. Amen. Now, you can say your sins are blotted out there, but nobody knows it. They're clean a slap over here someplace. It progresses. It's gradual. You don't go to that book with a meat axe and you're blindfolding your eyes, rightly dividing the word of truth, chomp, 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 and just cutting everything to pieces. That's wrongly dividing the word of truth. You know what Paul said in 1 Timothy 6? If any, listen, if any man consent not to wholesome words, I'm in, listen, I'm in 1 Timothy. I'm in a Pauline epistle written after the end of Acts 28. I mean, I'm seeing it with Bullinger. If any man consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There are things in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that are for you up in here. But you've got to study <laughs> to find out what they are. You don't throw Matthew out and say, well, that's this old flip. No, man, there's all kinds of good stuff in there. I'll give you a good one. Lay up treasures in heaven, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I'll give you a good one. The light of the whole body of the eye. I'll give you a good one. Let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. For more else comes, there are all kinds of stuff in there for Christians, the body of Christ. You have to study, study, study. And the Bereans are the ones who study the least. <laughs> because it, what it's blind here, I throw that out. Blind there, throw, you can't throw nothing out. You can't throw the Psalms out. You can't go. I'll give you a good verse for Pauline Christianity for the body of the one mystery of the mystery body of the one body. All the nations that forget God should be turning to hell. How's that? <clears throat> I'll give you another one. Uh, righteous exalts a nation, but sin is reproach to any people. I'll give you another one. There's a way which seemeth right to a man, but they are in the ways of death. You want 50 more? I know what they are. They're in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. <laughs> I'll give you a good one. There's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. I'll give you a good one. Every man at his best state's altogether vanity, and Paul didn't say it. 
And it's just as true a thing Paul ever wrote. Study, study, study. You get in there, sometimes there's a line, sometimes there's a verse just like that. You gotta put over here. Sometimes four verses, you gotta put over here. Sometimes half a verse. You come down there and say, from thence is the shepherd, first advent, comma, the stone of Israel, second advent, Daniel 2. It's in the middle of the verse. You don't just go cutting out whole books. On here, Jesus, what's this one here? If you're saved by grace through faith, but they don't know that, so the book of Acts progresses. And this thing is peculiar in that it has a dual application. It comes over here, and according to Paul, this winds up as the gospel of the grace of God. And in Acts chapter 15, now we get it, you could open here, in Acts 15, Simon Peter is convinced that a man is saved by grace through faith, and the council of Jerusalem, Simon Peter says, we believe we shall be saved even, we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. So the old fellow who got up here and said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, the mission of sins, is converted over here. And over here he says, there ain't no getting baptized for it, brother, by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we're saved, even as the Gentiles. So in Acts chapter 15, everybody agrees in the plan of salvation. And the plan of salvation is a man is saved by grace through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's settled officially right there. But it's a long time coming. It's a long time coming. And once it's settled officially, Paul baptizes converts there and baptizes converts there under the gospel of the grace of God. So Stan and Bullinger and Baker and O'Hare and Watkins don't know what they're talking about. They just don't like Baptists and like to make a living off of Baptist churches. You know why they work on you? Because you're the only people left in this country that know the Bible well enough to get screwed up in it. <laughs> That's why you can't mess up a Catholic in the Bible. You don't know if about dispensational truth to mess him up. Amen, brother. Amen. amen. All right, now I'm closing. This thing here goes over here in the church age and winds up applied to church age saints. But bless my soul, since he's a Jew and came to Israel and the baptism of John was manifest in Israel and I'm come to lost sheep house here, he has a double application right down here. And it goes right down here to that Jew in the tribulation. That New Testament has two applications. You want to see both of them in one book? Turn to Hebrews. I'll show both of them to you in one book. And they're not the same application. You say the book of Hebrews is a tribulation epistle. Not where I'm going to take you, it's not. Hebrews chapter 10. I take it back, one third of Hebrews 10 is tribulation, and the other thing is church age. You say, how can I tell? Study! <laughs> what he told you to do. Hebrews chapter 10. All right, Hebrews chapter 10, I want to have you get Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, put your uh, pinky on 15, verse 15. One pinky on 15, get Hebrews chapter 8. And put the other pinky on, uh, <laughs> I want a verse there that says, uh, This is the covenant I make with the house of Israel after those days. 10. All right, I want 8, 10. 8, 10. And 8, 10, I want 10, 15. All right, somebody read me the one in chapter 8, beginning at verse 10, read down through about verse 14. All right, that's good. Now give me the one in chapter 10. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is witness to us, hold the Holy Ghost, the one who the us is. Keep on reading. Whereof the Holy Ghost is also witness to us, for after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts. Hold it. First time he said us, next time he said them. The them of Israel. The us is somebody else. Keep on reading. I will put my laws in their hearts and their minds and my right hand, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now we're remission of these sins, these is, their is no more sin for us, and there's no more offering for sin. 
that's for you. You know, that's for you. Look at verse 12. That's yeah, for you. Look at verse 8. Now give me 10. There it is. That's the one effectual eternal sacrifice of Christ for the Christian for his sins are forgiven and taken away and that's the end of them. And part of it was taken out of there. But he didn't quote those two things there. He left them out. It's a double application. The new covenant applies to us in this age and it will apply to the house of Israel in the tribulation. And then the tribulation they'll come into their new covenant. Not here. So if you went to any accredited, recognized college in the world, they'd tell you that is the New Testament fulfilled in the church age. And it's not. You know, you know it's not? Go back to after chapter 8. Let's get on the soul one here. You know, you know it's not? In chapter 8, I want a verse there that says, And they shall not teach any more man his neighbor, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me from the least the greatest. What verse is that? 11. Look at verse 11. You have no business trying to win people to Christ. They're already all converted. See that thing? They shall not teach every man his neighbor, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me. Witnessing is forbidden in the millennium. You know what happens to finally witness in the millennium? How many of you know? Let me see your hands. Well, that shows how much time you've been spending with the boob tube, folks. <laughs> it's in Zechariah. You know what happens to a man if he witnesses for Christ what his mom and daddy are, due to, are to do to him? How many of you know now? Let me see your hands. What do they do to him, folks? They'll kill him. Thrust him through. Kill him. You got to burn for souls? Tough apples. Capital punishment. <laughs> How could you say they're the same? Incredible idiot going around saying salvation that's in the church age is the same as in the tribulation of the Old Testament. Well, the trouble with you, man, is, is, is if you, you, you're, just, you're just up the wall. You're spacey, man. You're blown clean out. There's anybody on crack or cocaine that's further out left field. You're so far out left field, you're out of the ball game, man. They're not even close. That thing has a double application. And boy, when you get in here, you've got an Old Testament situation. Faith and works. And when you get there, bless my soul, <laughs> there ain't nothing left but the Garden of Eden. Works. Let's see, Ruckman teaches one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine plans of salvation. He's got to be a heretic. I don't teach anything of the kind. I'm a Bible teacher. I teach the book. And that's what the book says. Turn to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. That's the book. If you don't like it, I'm sorry. That's the book. That's the book. Matthew 25. If you can find salvation by grace through faith in that thing, I'm a monkey's uncle, man. Matthew 25. Look at that thing. Matthew 25. Verse 1 and 2. That ain't the bride. That's somebody goes out to meet the bridegroom, not marry him. 25, 14. 25, 14. Those servants. The wicked one goes to hell. 25.31, look at 25.31, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and the Holy Angels willing to sit upon the throne of his glory, to divide the nation before him like a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats, and say to the ones on the right, come you blessed my fallen head, the kingdom of the foundation of the world, those on the left depart from you, curse and everlasting fire, prepare the devil and his angels, on the basis of what? In Matthew 25, look at verse 32, 33, 34, and 35. Matthew 25, verse 32, 33, 34, and 35. Works, 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 works. You couldn't find the gospel that mess with a flashlight. Take your Bible to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. Get you out to lunch now in about five minutes, Lord willing. Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 14. 
Revelation chapter 12. I don't have the reference marked here, but I want a verse uh, right near the end of chapter 12. It says, Here they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. 17, read it for us. They have kept the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Turn to Revelation chapter 14. I want a verse there about uh, in the middle of that chapter. Oh, I read that for me. Verse 12. One, two, faith and works. Turn to Revelation chapter 22, verse 14. Over and over and over and over and over and over. You couldn't miss it if you couldn't hit the broad side of a bar with a bunch of bananas. Revelation chapter 22, verse 14. Somebody read that. That works. Now, where did you ever read about that tree of life for before? Right there. It ended right like it began. Let us take the man and drive him out of the garden, lest he put forth his hand and eat the tree of life and live forever. Blessed they that do his commandments. Let me have a right to the tree of life. Works, 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 and no faith to it. In the millennium, Christ is right on the throne, and they see him. Turn to Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14. You see these dumb Baptists, you know what they think? They think the whole Bible is written for Baptists. They think the whole Bible has to teach Baptist doctrine. Well, it doesn't. How, how do you explain this? How do you explain the fact that on this earth today, 500 million professing Christians that believe in salvation by faith and works? You say they're wrong. I know they're wrong. I'm a Baptist. I believe, boy, you talk about a Baptist, man. I don't think you go to hell if you try it after you get saved. That's how strong I am, huh? You talk about eternal security. I'm in heaven right now. I ain't waiting to go. My body's waiting to go, but I ain't waiting to go. I'm gone. The Bible said I'm seated together with Christ in heavenly places. But my body is the trouble. I'm a, you think I'm worried about what's going to happen to me? My destination is fixed. Whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate. That's me, to be conformed to the image of his son. I'm fixed. <laughs> well, how do you account for the fact that 500 million Christians disagree with me? You think it's just because they're all stupid? No, it's because there's verse after verse in the Bible that indicates a man is saved by faith and works. It's all through there. That's what I'm trying to show you. But you've got to place it right. And you can't place it right unless you write it by the word. You can't write it by the word unless you study. <laughs> Zechariah 14. On Zechariah 14, there's the millennium. Somebody read me verse 16. There you go. In the millennium, Christ is on the throne of Jerusalem, and every year at the Feast of Tabernacles, they come up and look him right in the eyeballs. That's not faith. That's sight. Turn to Psalm 110. Psalm 110. That is no. In the millennium, when Christ reigns, somebody says, well, it's, uh, you know, we must have faith to do this and that. Listen, in the millennium, he's got enemies there that he rules over. They're not all saved. Uh, somebody read me Psalm 110, verse 2. Rule down in the midst of what? How about that? He got enemies in the millennium. And, and they see him. And some of them won't come up to see him at the tabernacle, so there's no rain in their land. All that stuff. All right, quickly now, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, Millennial Salvation. Let's see if any of this applies to you, any of these verses. Now, you remember a little while ago when I quoted you and said, Lay up your treasures in heaven, 
And quote the other version of the light of the mount of the eye. I'm right in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. I'm in the Sermon on the Mount, giving you New Testament doctrine from the Pauline epistles written by Matthew. <laughs> but now watch these verses here on salvation, the millennium. Some of you stand and read me Matthew chapter 5, verse 22. And you say people worry about going to hell? Well, sir, so if you call your mother a fool, you're near her. You see that thing? Paul says, Thou fool, thou which thou sowest is not quick and set to die. He didn't sweat not going to hell. Christ says in Luke chapter 24, O fools and slow of heart to leave all the props have spoken. He didn't worry about going to hell. Somebody got the birth placed in the wrong place. So let me read me Matthew chapter 5, verse 19. 519. Why, well, Paul didn't do it to keep the Old Testament commandments. He said the Sabbath wasn't even part of one, one part of one of them. You see where Seventh-day Adventist gets his stuff from? A Seventh-day Adventist got his stuff right from that thing right there. Somebody read me Matthew 5, 29. Somebody's got the Bible messed up. 5, 29, Matthew 5, 29. Somebody read me that. You want to try that? <laughs> God's giving you a hard time, eyes full of adultery. Okay, tear, tear out your eye and see if you can get in the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> Well, you can't. Origin, listen, the first president of the first Christian university was in Alexandria, Egypt, and the first Christian school in this country, the president, castrated himself according to that verse. What's wrong with him? He was a blockhead, that's what's wrong with him. <laughs> you know what's wrong with him? He didn't study. <laughs> Amen, brother. All right. One more, and we'll call a night or a day or something. <laughs> Matthew chapter 6. I hope you're getting something out of this. <laughs> now listen. <laughs> listen, I told you. I told you to be heavy, okay? I mean, I'll give you something light tonight, but I told you. It doesn't hurt you once in a while to, you know, get the gears going, get the rust off there, and get the thing going. We have guys coming down to school sometime. Honestly, goodness, they've been out of school for 10 years, and some of them flunked the second grade before they got out of school. <laughs> And when they get down, they have the worst time studying, you know. They have a time of it. And some ain't read nothing but comic books for ten years. And the, and, and the Southerners are, are there. They have the worst time the Yankees are, you know. I mean, Southerners, if you're not a Southerner, I'll tell you about something Southern you may not understand. But Southerners always think in concrete terms. And Yankees can think in abstract terms. And the Southerner has a hard time doing it. You know, I know that. Up here, any time you get north of Tennessee, you hear a bunch of Yankees talking in the restaurant. You know what you want them to say? He'll say, this is so. A fellow say something to this guy, say, this is true. That's the strangest thing, you know. I've heard that a hundred times every time I hear it. I look around, you know, where? <laughs> you know, this is true. What's true? See, when the guy says, this is true, I think, you know, where is it? <laughs> But if a guy says, that's so, or that's so, that's the truth, man, that's so, then it's not present. It's abstract it's out here someplace, see? So they say, that's the truth, man. That, that means that is the truth. That's the truth, man. But in order to say, this is so. <laughs> I never could get it. <laughs> but you take a southern boy that comes down, he picks up that book, begins to read it. He's like, Leroy Wright. You heard Leroy Wright. He, you had him up here, Leroy Wright? He says he never could sing because he picked up a song book, all those little notes and the stay, scale looks like a bunch of you're looking through a fence. <laughs> well, anyway, when a southern picks up that book, when a southern picks the book, we get to read, he reads through there and he says, And it came to pass after these things Saul went to Bethel. And it came after these things, and it came to pass after these things that Saul went to Bethel. Saul, 
went to Bethel. And you see, he's on that page, and all he sees is ink on the page. You see? He's used to a shotgun or a saw, you know, or a fishing rod or a car or something, you know, that, that you can handle. And here's this docks, and Saul went, and he went, Saul went to Bethel, and nothing comes. Now, fellow up there north, he reads that, then he, in his mind, he sees Saul going to Bethel, and has some kind of a concept, of, but not a southern. Old Nathan Bemis used to read through there and say, and the Lord went to Fulham to see if he could pick up Fulham. <laughs> he couldn't pronounce any of the words. <laughs> First time Jack Howell got up to preach, he said, he thought he'd do it idly with no notes, and he said, And the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel, saying, Thus saith the Lord. And the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel, saying, Thus saith the Lord. And the Lord came to Ezekiel, saying, <laughs> He emphasized every word in that thing, and nothing came to him, just blank. But sometimes you get it like that. Now that first prison, that Christian university was like that. He had a blank mind, man. He couldn't read. Now one more shot, Matthew 6.13, Matthew 6.13, called the Lord's Prayer. Detroit is filled with these dollar worshippers and these cake eaters, and every time they get in trouble they start saying, Our Father chart in heaven, hallowed be thy name. When Kennedy got his brain blown out there in, uh, in Dallas, Texas, uh, you notice his, his wife didn't go through that, you know. One of those sort of said to me, he said, You notice when he got his brain blown out, she went right upstairs to the old man. <laughs> I see this, this long to say, fellow's talking with you, you, you irreverent term referred to God as the old man, you see. But when she, when he got shot, you know what Jackson said? She said, oh my God. She forgot all about Mary. Yeah, yeah. Why don't she say, hey Mary, you know, full of grapes, blessed be the fruit of the loom, all that stuff. She didn't go in that kind of stuff, you know. All right, now, every time, you see, it's so strange, the guy is dying. He's going to die and going to hell, and the priest says, Repeat after me, my son, our father of God. That won't get you to heaven, it'll get you to hell. I mean, a, 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 a hail Mary pass. Hail Mary, and she'll hail right back, man. Let Mary tend to her knitting. I've got more important things to do. That isn't the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6. That's the disciples' prayer. Somebody read me Matthew 6, 9. Or make it 8. No, go ahead. Pray who? Pray ye. ye. That's the disciples. That ain't the Lord's prayer. It's the disciples' prayer. Okay, go ahead. Stop. We're not praying for the kingdom to come. We're praying for the church to go. Go ahead. Is that the plan of salvation? Not for me. <laughs> forgive us our trespass, we forgive those who trespass. Let's hope not. <laughs> Go ahead. And we do not have patience, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the kingdom. power, and the glory forever. You know what that is? That's a Jew out here in the tribulation, and he can't get his bread because he won't take the mark of the beast, so he's praying, Give us this day our daily bread. Hand the mouth one day at a time, God providing for him, because he can't get it from the devil. People, people, every heresy taught in this age, every heresy taught in this age is the truth put in the wrong place. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a word that needs not to be shamed, might divine the word of truth. All right, brother, come here. I don't have a date on it. Uh, I guess Schofield's I guess Schofield date is good as any. What is his date? Well, I just got to know if it's 1951. I was wondering if you had figured it out. Or no, I'm not very good in chronology. 51 is probably good as anything. Right. Thank you.